Coming up on Doctype, we're going to be taking another look at design patterns and alternative forms of navigation. And we're going to see if CoffeeScript just might be able to clean up your JavaScript. So I forgot my line, and it's time for Doctype. This episode of Doctype is brought to you by Colab Orlando and GoDaddy. I'm Nick Pettit. And I'm Jim Hoskins. And you're watching Doctype. Whether you're a designer that thinks JavaScript is a decaf latte, or a developer who can't tell his margin from his padding, Doctype has the latest tips, tricks, and tools to help make you the emperor of the interwebs. Alrighty. Now, if you missed it on la the last episode and the episode before it, we are now on YouTube. So if you haven't subscribed yet, you're going to want to head over to youtube.com slash user slash Doctype TV and subscribe. And this week, Nick and I are actually in London for the future of web apps. If you happen to be in the area, stop by and say hi. And next week, we will not be having a normal episode, but we are going to try to get you some very special content from the event. And we want to remind you that we are up for a .NET award. Head over to thenetawards.com and vote for Doctype for Video Podcast of the Year. Voting ends soon, and we really would appreciate your votes. So this week, I'll be telling you about CoffeeScript, a different flavor of JavaScript programming. And I will be revisiting design patterns and showing you some alternative forms of navigation. Let's check it out. CoffeeScript is a language that compiles into JavaScript. It takes the best parts of JavaScript and makes them available in a less verbose form. It uses very efficient patterns to translate short language constructs in CoffeeScript into valid JavaScript. Now, these patterns also make it difficult to make common mistakes like misscoping a variable. CoffeeScript can be used as a compiler to translate .coffee files into .js files. It also has a library that allows the browser to natively interpret CoffeeScript code in your web pages. Now, you probably don't want to be using that functionality in production, but it's a cool little example, and you can even test it out on the CoffeeScript website shown here. Now, CoffeeScript takes a lot of ideas from Python, Ruby, and other modern programming languages to build an easier language to use. Now, the whole project isn't really ideal for production use yet, but it's definitely worth playing around with and studying because you can still learn a lot about JavaScript by studying its output. So let's take a look at a few examples of how CoffeeScript translates into JavaScript. So this example is a pretty simple thing of just assigning values. Now, you'll notice here we're just saying number equals 42. Now, in normal JavaScript, we would have to use a var declaration, and we would want to put a semicolon at the end. So in CoffeeScript, there are no semicolons. Every line is a new expression, except when it explicitly makes sense that it's going to be continued onto another line. Also, the var keyword is unnecessary because CoffeeScript will automatically see these variables and give you the var statement for you. Now, this is good because you can't accidentally scope something to a global variable by forgetting the var statement, which is a common JavaScript mistake. CoffeeScript also gives us the ability to have special predicates like this if operator here. So here we can have a conditional assignment where we say number equals negative 42, and then at the end of the line say if opposite. So what this translates to is an if opposite code block and then the code that we're running. So it's a very simple translation, but it does save you a lot of code and picks up some features from other languages like Ruby. Now, functions are where it really shines. In normal JavaScript, we use functions a lot, especially anonymous functions as callbacks. But the shortest way to write a valid JavaScript function is to use the full function keyword, parentheses, and curly braces. And that's a lot of excess code. In CoffeeScript, a function is defined with parentheses, optional parameters in those parentheses, and then an arrow and then the expression that is the function. Now, you don't need a return statement because the last expression in your function definition is automatically returned from the function. So we can see here we're defining a function called square, and it's going to return x times x. So we can leave out the function keyword and the return keyword in this example. Now, we can see it doesn't have to be all on one line. In this case, we're creating a function called hello that takes a parameter place and we have multiple lines inside of that function. Now, CoffeeScript uses indentation to denote where the function ends and begins. So in this case, we have a couple of lines inside of our function. We're creating a string that is hello plus the place parameter, 
And the last expression is that hello place plus exclamation points. So when it translates down, it not only defines our vars, but it also constructs our string plus place and inserts our return keyword. Now if you want to concatenate strings, CoffeeScript offers us a great way to do it. So in this case, I'm defining a variable called world and a variable called greeting. And you can see if I'm using double quoted strings, I can use a special interpolation format, which is a hash sign and curly braces. The content of the curly braces will be inserted into that string. If we see how that's done in JavaScript, we're creating the normal place variable and the greeting is expanded out to a parenthesized expression with our literal part of the string, as well as the dynamic part of our string. Now another cool ability that CoffeeScript has is the ability to round up the extra parameters from function calls into a name parameter. So in this case, we're defining a function called race, and it takes a parameter called winner, and the rest of the arguments are runners denoted by this dot, dot, dot. So what this means is we can pass in a winner, and then any number of runners when we actually call the function. And so how this works is a little more complicated. So we have a normal function definition, and you can see above this, it creates a variable to hold the array.prototype.slice method, which allows us to get part of a JavaScript array. Then inside of the function, it actually determines the value of the runner's variable by calling slice on the arguments and taking all the arguments past one, since there was one named argument. So then inside of the function, you can reference both winner and runners to get the rest of the arguments passed. Now, CoffeeScript might not be a project that you want to use on a production project, but it's fun to play around with. And if you check out their website, you can see all the different details of the CoffeeScript language and how they translate into JavaScript. By studying that, you can see a lot of cool JavaScript tips that you might be able to use in your own website. If you're in Orlando and you're watching this show, you need to be at Colab Orlando. Located in the heart of downtown, Colab Orlando has become a magnet for creative thinkers and entrepreneurs, like you and me. If you're just stopping by for the day, or if you're starting the next big thing, Colab has you covered. With affordable office space, high-speed internet, and a great environment built for collaboration, Colab is the best place to co-work. Even we work there now. And if you're not in Orlando, be sure to check out the new Colab space that just opened up in downtown Nashville. If you want to become a member of Colab, or if you're just curious, be sure to check them out at colabusa.com. Today, we are going to be revisiting the Yahoo Design Pattern Library. Let's take a look. So in episode 19, we looked at a few examples of more traditional forms of navigation, but today we're going to look at some additional forms of navigation in the Yahoo Design Pattern Library, and we're going to evaluate them to see how we can use them in our sites. So first up are breadcrumbs. Breadcrumb navigation is a list of links going from left to right, usually separated by arrows pointing to the right. Going from left to right, each link takes you one level deeper into the site. Breadcrumb navigation is very useful when your site is very deep. If there are a lot of pages and your site features a complex architecture of information, you can give your site visitors a much better picture into the structure of your site if you provide them with a visual map of where they are. So breadcrumbs are also very useful when the site navigation isn't readily visible. Here we have a page from apple.com and we can see we're in the Mac section, we're looking at an iMac, and we're looking at the tech specs. And from this view, it's very apparent from where we are. So like I said, if we zoom in here, we can see that we're in the section dealing with Mac computers because that area of the navigation is highlighted. We can also see the title of the page. And if we go over here, we can see that we're looking at the technical specifications because that's what's highlighted in this horizontal list of links. But if we go down to the bottom here, we can't see the navigation at the top of the page. Down here though, we have this nice breadcrumb trail. So if we go backwards, it almost reads like a sentence. We're looking at the technical specifications for the iMac, which is one of the Macs you can find on Apple's website. That's a lot of information to get across, but a breadcrumb trail does it in a very understandable way that doesn't take up a lot of space. Next up are progress bars, and these are actually very similar to breadcrumb navigation. 
A progress bar consists of a list of horizontal links going from left to right, with arrows pointing to the right. The difference is, rather than indicating how deep a user is into your site, progress bars indicate how far along a user is in a particular process, like signing up for a new web service or checking out of an e-commerce store. One really great example of a progress bar is on Amazon.com. When you go to purchase an item and check out, they have a dynamic progress bar that guides you through the process no matter where you are. So here I have attempted to purchase an Amazon Kindle, but I'm not signed in yet, so it takes me to the sign up form. Amazon has started off the progress bar with a step where I need to sign in. If I were already signed in, I would have passed this step and been on to shipping and payment. One thing to be careful of with progress bars is to not make them look like breadcrumb navigation like you see here. If you look at the top of the screen, you can see that there is an indicator under the current step and it is highlighted, but steps that come later are underlined and they're linked. Rather, there should be a clear course of action that needs to be taken on the page itself. Amazon does this well because the only way to move forward is to fill out the sign-in form. The future steps in the process are grayed out and they're not linked. Finally, we come to tag clouds. And tag clouds are very interesting and they're what I would consider to be a form of experimental navigation. Over the past couple years, tag clouds have really caught on and are especially popular on blogs and websites that are very heavy with content. They're even pretty fun to program and write the CSS styling for. In some cases, tag clouds are actually pretty nice because they improve discoverability. When there are just a few links like this and the font sizes aren't too distant from one another, it really improves discoverability and you can really see what the most popular things are on the site. And you also really get a feel for what the site is all about. However, I'm going to recommend against the use of tag clouds. They're useful in some situations when the number of tags and the styling is very well controlled. Take this example though. There's way too many tags, it's hard to even figure out what the site is mostly about, and it's not very well styled. The smaller links are lighter in color and they're very difficult to read. It really just ends up adding a ton of clutter to the site and doesn't improve navigation or discoverability at all. Listen, you need a domain name. You know it, I know it, but where are you gonna go get it? GoDaddy, that's where. If you're looking to drive viewers to your video content, then .tv domains are where it's at. .tv domains are perfect for podcasters, video bloggers, and anyone with something to say. And they're available now at GoDaddy.com. Heck, where do you think we got Doctype.tv from? So we know you all get your domains from GoDaddy, but whose code are you gonna use? Enter the code Doctype3 when you check out and save an additional 10% off your entire order. Some restrictions apply see site for details get your piece of the internet at godaddy.com that is it for this week until next time be sure to check us out at facebook.com slash doctype and follow at doctype tv on twitter and if you have a question you'd like answered on a future episode of doctype send us an email at questions at doctype.tv and if you subscribe via itunes or rss or youtube you'll never miss an episode of doctype so until next time, remember that every great web page starts with Doctype. Mm -hmm. Night night. That's down there. Okay. Starts with Doctype. Mm, oh yeah, I dropped it. That's right. Remember that thing that happened two seconds ago? <laughs>